Today, I'll be discussing an approach to hemoptysis. Since hemoptysis is by definition a manifestation of bleeding in the lungs, a diagnostic framework based on organ system would not really make sense here. Therefore, I'll be using one which uses the functional components of the lungs, starting with the airways. Hemoptysis can be caused by acute bronchitis, which is usually caused itself by a virus. It can be caused by bronchiectasis, which is a permanent widening of the airways, resulting in chronic infections. Hemoptysis can be caused by cancers, either primary lung or metastatic to lung, as well as aspiration of a foreign body. Moving on to the pulmonary parenchyma, there is tuberculosis, the spectrum between a necrotizing pneumonia and lung abscess, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis and chronic necrotizing aspergillosis, and parasitic infections, most classically described with Paragonimus westermani, also known as a lung fluke, which is most commonly seen in East and Southeast Asia, though not limited to those regions, and which is most commonly transmitted to people by consumption of undercooked shellfish. In the category of pulmonary vascular conditions are both an acute pulmonary embolism and a pulmonary arteriovenous malformation. And last, there is a miscellaneous category which includes vasculitis, particularly a condition called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, and anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, also known as good pastures disease. I would also consider hemoptysis in the setting of impaired hemostasis to be in this category. This includes genetic conditions such as hemophilia, as well as inquired ones such as anticoagulant therapy. However, hemostasis impairment still usually requires another trigger from this list for hemoptysis to occur. It's usually not spontaneous. But these can make a condition that typically causes mild hemoptysis to be much more severe. In developed countries, the most common causes of hemoptysis are acute bronchitis, bronchiectasis, and cancer, both primary lung and endobronchial mets. There is also a subset of patients who have so-called massive hemoptysis, which is sometimes defined as greater than 500 milliliters of expectorated blood within a 24-hour period. But of course, no one actually measures it in practice. Thus, the term massive hemoptysis is usually used to describe a degree of hemoptysis which is imminently life-threatening, irrespective of quantifiable volume. There is not great data on the relative frequencies of etiologies of massive hemoptysis, but bronchiectasis appears to be the most common. Finally, while tuberculosis and paragonimus westermani infections are relatively uncommon causes of hemoptysis in the developed world, massive or otherwise, they are very significant causes in the developing world. Important initial components of the history for a patient presenting with hemoptysis includes both the duration and approximate volume of hemoptysis, keeping in mind that it's very hard for patients to accurately quantify the volume of expectorated blood. The concurrent presence of dyspnea, chest pain, rash, arthralgias, fever, night sweats, or weight loss, chronic lung disease, immunosuppression, smoking history, and travel history. Vitals are always relevant. And the remainder of the physical exam should focus on pulmonary and cardiac exams, a thorough lymph node exam, and a skin exam looking for cutaneous evidence of vasculitis or bleeding disorder. Although I excluded it from the framework due to its rarity, the presence of cutaneous telangiectasias in a patient with hemoptysis suggests the presence of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. And if, after the history, cancer or vasculitis is a consideration, a much more thorough head-to-toe exam should be performed. Key labs include a CBC, in which the white blood cell count, hemoglobin, and platelets are all quite relevant. A PTT and INR are also indicated. And all patients presenting with hemoptysis warrant a chest x-ray, unless clinical features lead you to skip right to a chest CT, which is sometimes an appropriate thing to do, particularly if cancer or a pulmonary embolism is suspected, or if the patient is a smoker who meets guideline criteria for a screening chest CT anyway. When it comes to the diagnostic algorithm, the first step is to be sure you are actually dealing with hemoptysis and not hematemesis, or vomiting blood. On one hand, that might seem like an easy distinction to make, but having encountered both of these numerous times, 
I can say that it actually is not always that easy, especially if the patient is only reporting the bleeding and isn't actively bleeding in front of you. Or on the other hand, if the bleeding is massive, but the patient is not coherent and stable enough to provide a clear history. Let's look at some considerations when trying to distinguish between these two possibilities. Features suggestive of hemoptysis as a source of blood include no GI symptoms, known lung disease, a bright red or pink color to the blood, a liquid or clotted consistency to it, and if the sample is available, an alkaline pH. Features suggestive of hematemesis include concurrent nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, known gastric or liver disease, a dark red, brown, or black color of the blood, consistency like coffee grounds, and if available, an acidic pH. As an FYI, pH testing of the blood is not commonly done in practice, but can be considered if the picture is otherwise unclear. If hemoptysis is felt to be the most likely situation, then a chest x-ray is the next step, or possibly a chest CT, as mentioned a minute ago. While if hematemesis is felt to be most likely, then workup for an upper GI bleed is indicated, which may include nasogastric lavage and almost always includes an EGD. The approach to hematemesis will be the topic of a future video. Patients can also have bleeding in the nasopharynx or oropharynx that can have the potential to be mistaken for hemoptysis as well. After you've confirmed your patient has hemoptysis, if they receive a chest x-ray instead of a CT, the findings can be placed into one of three categories. First, along with consideration of the history and exam, it could show a probable infection. If so, additional workup should be based on the suspected infectious etiology. If the onset of illness was acute, that is the overall illness, not just the hemoptysis, the patient has fever, the hemoptysis is mild in severity, and there are focal lung opacities on chest x-ray, that is all consistent with bacterial pneumonia. Additional workup is often not necessary, but blood and sputum cultures and or urine antigen testing may be indicated in certain circumstances, such as a healthcare-associated pneumonia, severity requiring ICU admission, alcohol abuse, a failure to improve with conventional antibiotics, or the concurrent presence of a pleural effusion. On the other hand, if the onset of illness was subacute to chronic, is associated with weight loss, the patient is immunosuppressed, has relevant travel history, and the x-ray shows cavitary and or nodular lesions, these are more consistent with mycobacterial or fungal pneumonia. Keep in mind that TB can also present with a lobar infiltrate and or pleural effusion on chest x-ray. If TB is a consideration, the patient should be placed on respiratory isolation with serial sputum samples for AFB smear and culture. Non-tuberculous mycobacteria also require AFB smears and cultures. And if fungal pneumonia is a consideration, diagnosis is usually based on a combination of direct examination of sputum under microscopy, culturing the fungus from sputum, and testing for specific antibodies in the serum, which is best done in consultation with an infectious disease specialist or your facility's microbiology lab. And any patient falling into this category of subacute to chronic pneumonia should also have an HIV test if not already recently done. Now, going back to the chest x-ray, if it shows a lung mass or some other finding that is not strongly suggestive of infection, the next step is a chest CT. And if the initial x-ray is normal, consider whether the patient's history is suggestive of acute bronchitis. For example, is their hemoptysis mild and from a single self-limited episode? Are there no systemic symptoms like fatigue, night sweats, or fever? And is the patient a non-smoker? If the answer to all of these questions is yes, then close observation can be considered, but this will be a minority of patients. One study found that about a quarter of patients presenting with hemoptysis due to malignancy initially had a normal chest x-ray, so have a low threshold for ordering the CT. And some clinicians would discuss with the patient the benefits and harms of a CT, even if they did meet all of the considerations for a probable benign etiology. And if the patient's history did have any high-risk features, then you should definitely get a CT. From the chest CT, as with the x-ray before it, results can be placed into several categories. First, if it shows probable infection, our algorithm merges back up to here. If it shows probable cancer, a PET scan is appropriate to see if the mass is hypermetabolic and to see if there's evidence of distant disease. 
These patients will also need a strategy for biopsy, either bronchoscopy for central masses, a CT-guided transcutaneous approach by interventional radiology for peripheral masses, or the biopsy of a distant hypermetabolic site identified by PET, which could both confirm cancer and confirm it, that it's metastatic with a single procedure. If the chest CT shows other findings, work it up as indicated, including consideration of rare etiologies. However, the most common CT finding in this category is bronchiectasis, which depending on the patient's history and the radiographic distribution of the bronchiectasis may or may not warrant additional workup. And last, if the chest CT is normal, it's critical to realize that malignancy has not necessarily been ruled out, depending upon how low the pretest probability of it had been. So consider following up a normal CT with bronchoscopy, and at the very least, close observation. That's an overview to an approach to hemoptysis. Key takeaway points include, as hemoptysis originates from the lungs by definition, the most logical diagnostic framework categorizes etiologies by the parts of the lungs they affect. Acute bronchitis, bronchiectasis, and cancer are the most common causes of hemoptysis in the developed world, while tuberculosis and paragonimus westermani are significant causes of hemoptysis in the developing world. If the initial workup does not indicate a probable infectious etiology, most patients will warrant a chest CT. And last, a normal chest CT does not necessarily rule out cancer in a patient with hemoptysis, particularly if there are high-risk features present, such as a smoking history or weight loss.